I was ministering in Ulladulla. Have you ever been to Ulladulla? Try not to, yeah. Just a few, few months ago, actually. That was a lovely place in Australia. I enjoyed that. I swam in the ocean. It was 21 degrees. I come from Invercargill. Believe me, the air temperature sometimes gets to 21 degrees, but never the water. But we had a great time in Ulladulla. 15 young people gave their hearts to Jesus on the first night. That was fantastic. Never seen Jesus as their saviour before. What a great start to the weekend. I can tell you, it was fantastic. Ulladulla. Say Ulladulla. Say it backwards. Yeah, very good. There you go. I love it. I love it. It's fantastic stuff. Isn't Dale gorgeous? Dale, my first wife. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Yes, everybody's a bit slow this morning. Eh? Thank you for keeping up. It's jolly good of you. I came across this, this accident report. I worked in a hospital for 18 years and, uh, and dealt a lot with what was known as workers' compensation in those days, ACC today. And I was involved in uh, statistics and medical statistics and all of those kind of things. And, and I'm always interested in finding little reports of uh, people's uh, uh, little kinds of uh, soirees through life. And uh, so here we go. Here's a, a bricklayer's accident report. Uh, and... Uh, and it goes like this, and uh, says, Dear Sir, I'm writing in response to your request for additional information in Block 3 of the accident reporting form. I put poor planning as the cause of my accident. You asked for a more complete explanation, and I trust the following details will be sufficient. I am a brick bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building, and when I completed my work, I found I had some bricks left over, which, when weighed later, were found to weigh 240 pounds. Rather than carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley which was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor. Securing a rope at ground level, I went up to the roof, I swung the barrel out and loaded the bricks into it, and then I went down and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 240 pounds of bricks. You will notice on the accident report form that my weight is 135 pounds. Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. <clears throat> Needless to say, I proceeded up at a rapid rate the side of the building, and in the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel, which was now proceeding downward in an equally impressive speed. This explains the fractured skull, minor abrasions, broken collarbone, as listed in Section 3, Accident Reporting Form. <laughs> Slowed only slightly. I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley, which I mentioned in paragraph two of this correspondence. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope, and in spite of the excruciating pain I was now beginning to experience, but at, at approximately the same time, the barrel of bricks hit the ground, and the bottom fell out of the barrel. And now devoid of the weight of bricks, the barrel weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight, and as you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building, and in the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up, which accounts for the two fractured ankles, broken tooth, and severe laceration of my legs and lower body. Here, my luck began to change slightly. The encounter with the barrel seemed to slow me enough to lessen my injuries, and I fell onto the pile of bricks, and fortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. I am sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the pile of bricks, in pain, unable to move, and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my composure and presence of mind and let go of the rope. And as you can imagine, the empty barrel crashed down upon me. While this appears to be an involved explanation, it all happened in a matter of seconds. And I trust that answers your concern. Please be assured, I have given up trying to do the job alone. Regards, Patty. Isn't that great? 
who knows it's really great to plan things you know just kind of have a little think through on some of those things i remember you know working um in gore hospital who's ever been to gore i met someone from gore last night oh get out of here <laughs> you can get that fixed at any hospital <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly squeamish, but, but, you know, there are some things that make me a little bit squirmy. And, uh, and I remember this lady coming in, she had, she had these enormous bandages on her, on her toes. And, um, and uh, I said, what did you do to your toes? You know, she said, well, I was working down at the, uh, at the freezing works down at Matara there. And, uh, and she said, I was coming through with a big tray of meat, you know. And, uh, and you know, those flip-flop doors I was going through. And as I came through the other door, someone came in and the door just rode straight over my my feet and I had jandals on, thongs for you Australians, and just peeled all my toenails right back, just like that. At that point I went, moment please, <laughs> and went away for a quiet coffee and came back and, and uh, completed dealing with her, but uh, yeah, there are some things a little bit like that. Amen. I am looking forward to inspire, I don't know why I told you that, but I just like seeing people, seeing people who had breakfast. <laughs> There's a few white looking Maoris here this morning now too, that's quite good. <laughs> Hey, listen, um, Inspire Conference for me has, last year, I had such a cool time, and I'm so looking forward to coming back with Nick and Karen and you guys. And, uh, and this morning, I just want to just encourage you and, and, uh, and uh, just, uh, just unpack some things for you that I trust will help you and inspire you as well. My mum, and I often tell the story, and uh, my mum's 85, she was 85 last week actually, and I uh, got saved when she was 17 at a tent revival meeting in Invercargill. She's never moved from Invercargill. She lives there to this day. And uh, she's a conservative evangelical, and uh, she's been very conservative. I was brought up in a very conservative home, and, uh, and uh, you've, many of you have heard that story before. And, uh, and so uh, mum and, and dad were just great people. Dad passed away about 20 years ago. He's a tremendous uh, supporter of Dale and I. And uh, whilst he wasn't a Pentecostal, came to my ordination as a Pentecostal minister and, and uh, coped with that okay. And, uh, and so that was really good. And uh, but the tremendous supporters. But uh, just before Christmas, my mum said to me, so how long are you going to be in Invercargill? And uh, without thinking, I said, longer than you. And, um, and, and she's a bit Irish, so she understands a little bit of those things. And, uh, and uh, so I said, I oh, know, I'm going to be here for a while. And she said, I want to join your church. And uh, I said to her, I said, mum, <laughs> you know, we swing from chandeliers. We roll on the carpet and froth at the mouth. She said, I know that. I've been sometimes. It's disgraceful. <laughs> and uh, in fact, her friends, true story, her friends uh, from her church, the little church she was going to, she said, uh, they'd say, how do you cope at the Invercargill Christian Centre? I mean, it's, the music's so loud. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of young people running around. And, there's, and it's, you know, it's like noise. And, you know, there's, there's Pentecostals there and all those things. She said, I just take two disciplines and have a lie down. She told that true story. <laughs> and so anyway, she came and joined us. And, uh, and uh, there she sits in the back row, and uh, she's enjoying all of that with some of her oldies, and, uh, and uh, it's fantastic, you know. And then about a month after she, she arrived there, she said, I want something to do. I said, what do you mean you want something to do? You're 85. And uh, she said, oh, I want something to do. What can I do? She said, I said, I don't know what you can do. You're not going to worship lead, that's for sure. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have the quavering voice, I can tell you. So, and uh, and uh, she said, I want to I work in the crash. And I'm going, you're kidding me. I said, you don't, you don't want mum, mum, you don't want to work in the crash. And she looked at me and she says, do you think I'm too old? <laughs> and again, without thinking in my Homer Simpson mind, you know, anybody, ever, anybody ever have that Homer Simpson mind? You think it, but suddenly it's out? Is there anybody else out there? One person, God bless you. Amen. We know what it's like, I tell you. And I said, no, you're not too old. You're decrepit. <laughs> <laughs> to me, mum. <laughs> She's Irish. You know, I cry sometimes. She said, ah, oh, God's wired you up. She just made your bladder too close to your eyes. <laughs> She's just a bit like that. She's just funny. You've got to understand it. So I'm... Pulling it in, so no, 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 mum, you can't do that. In the end, she pleaded and groveled and, and promised me, you know, to be left in her will and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, 
And, and I said, okay, you can go. And we, we, I organized it, rang our office, and I said, look, put my mum down. And they're looking at me like, you can't do that. You know, they'll kill her. And I went, no, no, believe me, they won't kill her. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, from personal experience. But anyway, and she gets in the crazy there. She loves it. 85 years old. It's fantastic. She gets up there. One of the things she looks forward to, they roster her only once a month, but uh, she's in there, and she looks forward to that. And, uh, and then I had our seniors pastor come to me, and, uh, and he said, Ian, I want to need to talk to you. I said, yeah, what's my He says, your mum's in crash. I said, I know. Is she doing all right? Yeah, but she can't be in there. Why not? What's she doing? She's pinching things? And <laughs> says, no, no, no. No, no, no. See, he said, no, yeah. Oh, and he did the old, you know, oh, and he's trying to negotiate with me. I'm the senior pastor. He's the senior's pastor, you know. He's trying to kind of like they're doing the, she's, like, she's not in there. And, yeah, it's not good. It's not good, Ian. It's not good. I was, well, why isn't it good? And then I suddenly took and says, she's making you guys look bad. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, that's, <laughs> so I'm having trouble with the oldies. They're, they're all going. They just want to, you know, just want to cruise. And your mum's in there with her sleeve dolled up and she's working? I said, eh, you need to understand, she got saved when she was 16 and she's going to have a day off when she goes and sees Jesus. As far as she's concerned, we're working in the church. We've got a lost and dying world to save and we're going to get our sleeves rolled up and we're going to do this stuff. Isn't that fantastic? I tell you, I love that. But last weekend, sorry, weekend, weekend, when was Pentecost? A couple of weekends ago. I, my personal mission in life, because I was never brought up a Pentecostal. I, I, I was brought up a... Anyway, and I mean, the first person I ever heard speak in tongues was me. True story. I, I've never been to a, you know, a, I've never been to a, I've never been anywhere. <laughs> I, I've never been to a Pentecostal church. I've never been to a, in those days, they were like, they had people to have cell groups and they'd turn the lights down and hold hands, you know, and, and I'm going, and, uh, it was like the charismaniacs or something. I never go near those people. I warned off them. You know, give away from those things. They're a terrible thing. But when someone laid hands on me, and, I, and, and, and out, of, out of an hour and a half, I just spoke in tongues. It was fantastic. Got a Yamaha, should have bought a Honda. You know, just the whole thing, just right out there. And, and it was an amazing experience for me. And, and so, you know, I just, just got into this. The word that I was brought up with was phenomenal. But when the power of the Spirit came on that, I tell you what, it just began to break through areas in my life. Well, I've been, my personal mission for Pentecostals is to redeem Pentecost. And so uh, we had Nick down a couple of years ago, and that was phenomenal. In fact, a year ago, Nick came down, and there was a number of folks in the church were baptized in the Spirit for the first time, speaking in tongues, and, and we had just a great time. The year before wasn't so hot, and I don't want to talk about that, all right? And don't ask me, because I'm not going to tell you. It was bad. Tell Nick. Talk to Nick. And uh, anyway, but, but uh, this year I thought, I don't know what I'm doing. I've got an Australian across. And uh, there's a guy called David Hall, young fella, Tim Hall's son, you know, so, yeah, yeah, so he, he came, and, uh, and uh, I'd only heard him on tape before, and uh, that, he was a wild man, he was unbelievable, I loved him, it was just like phenomenal, you know, he got in there, and, and some of our youth had already met him, and all that kind of thing, and that was fine, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, my mum is in the back row, and, 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 and David Hall goes, you! <laughs> and I'm going, who's he talking to? And he goes, oh, it's my mother. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the front row, freaking out, you know, going, don't do this. You know, you have not heard God. This is like, what, what you have heard is the voices. It's not God, you know. Keep taking the medication. Whatever it is you're on, do not call my mother out the front, you know, because, you know, my inheritance is on the line. <laughs> And some other ladies come down, and he goes, no, madam, you, you know, and anyway, in the end, mum comes down, 85, you know, and she trundles down, we've got a little kind of like an auditorium thing, and slopes, and <coughs> oh, I feel better with those five gone, and, and, and then she gets down the front there, and, and I, I immediately just go right up behind her, and I'm behind her, like the catcher, you know, like, mm, I'm the catcher. Everybody else is behind me, all right? And, and, and I'm, looking at, I'm looking at young David, and I'm going, she's my mother. <laughs> you know, in a stage, sort of a kind of a, she's my mother, whisper. whisper. And he's going, <laughs> thick as two short bricks, honestly. <laughs> she's my mother. You know, she's in front, and he goes, oh, she's your mother. 
Yes. <laughs> In other words, you know, kind of be gentle, you know, all this kind of thing. And it was really funny. He just laid hands on it. And my mum, I mean, I've known my mum for a long time. And, uh, and, and, and there she is, she's getting hands laid on her like that. And, and she's going, Ooh, and she's starting to cry. And the old bottom lips going, and I'm going, I, I'm distancing myself immediately from my mother now. <laughs> I don't care how Irish you are. And then she just, she's like there, and then she just gets slain in the spirit. You go, boom, on the floor. And I'm looking at her. And I'm going, we're in trouble now. And, and, and she's down on the floor there and she's crying and shaking. And, and, and I'm going, you, you, know, you know when you know some people? You know when you just know some people and you know that can only be God or a vast amount of drugs. Uh, and I knew it wasn't the latter, you know. So I, it, it, it's kind of like, it, it's, it's God. And I remember she's crying and just loving God on the floor. And I remember trying, I remember... I remember reaching down and, and just, just whispering in her ear and says, I'm going to tell all your Baptist friends. <laughs> and she just started to laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. I love the power of the Spirit. I love seeing people getting energized by God. And if anything over this weekend, that I, I just want, I want you to open your hearts to be inspired again by God inspired again by the Holy Ghost. I want you to open your Bibles this morning. I want to just uh, uh, just unpack something for us this morning in, in John chapter 5. It's a scripture you'll know so, so well. But uh, John, John 5 tells a story. Who's sitting beside someone incredibly attractive this morning and anointed? Uh, who is that person there? That, it's lovely. Please, yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. It's lovely. John 5. And John 5 says this, and I'm reading out of the Amplified Version. It says, Later on, there was a Jewish festival or a feast for which Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And now there is in Jerusalem a pool by the sheep gate, and this pool in Hebrew is called Bethesda, having five porches. In verse 3, it says, In these lay a great multitude or a number of sick folk, some blind, crippled, some paralyzed, waiting for the bubbling up or the stirring of the water. For the angel of the Lord went down at appointed seasons into the pool and moved and stirred up the water. And whoever then first after the stirring of the water stepped in was cured of whatever disease with which he was afflicted. And there was a certain man there who had suffered with a deep-seated and lingering disorder uh, for 38 years. And when Jesus noticed him lying there helpless, knowing that he had already been there a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you want to become well? The Amplified says, are you really in earnest about getting well? Verse 7 says, the invalid answered, said, sir, I have no one when the water is moving to put me into the pool, but why I'm trying to come into it myself, someone else steps down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your bed and walk. And instantly, say instantly. I love the instantly, instant, inst, I love those things in the Bible, they're fantastic. Instantly the man became well and recovered his strength and picked up his bed and he walked. I've read that story since I was a kid. I've seen it on flannel graph. I, who remembers flannel graph? Look at the old people. Yeah, men peeling off the board under the power of the gravity. Remember that? Remember sitting in children's church going... <laughs> trying to blow them off, you know, fantastic, yeah, I remember that, I remember all of those things, and you'd move the wee man closer to the pool, you know, and the angel hovering over that looked nothing like I want to see any angels looking like, but anyway, I've entitled this message this morning, Relaxing by the Pool, as opposed to Twisting, Twisting by the Pool, Relaxing by the Pool, because here's, here's a guy who was there for 38 years, who remembers 38 years? Who's looking forward to 38 years? Who doesn't want to talk about 38 years? 38 years is a long time. 38 years is a heck of a long time. And here's a guy who has been incredibly unwell, and he has been sitting by this pool or lying by this pool for all of that time, and he has been waiting because every now and again, an angel would come down, and they believed that the waters would be stirred, they'd be troubled, they'd be good, and the first one in, 
was healed. It was kind of like expectation was in the room. Remember, remember when he went there 38 years ago, you know, he was so unwell and his family and friends took him there and he was, he was there and they put him by the pool and they'd say, look, you just have to watch for the water. You know, we're to go, watch him be ready, watch him be ready, watch him be ready. And he watched for 38 years as his family and his friends left and everybody else got healed. And here he was uh, lying by the pool. Now he was ensconced. He was camped. He was there. He was right beside his pool. He, he was just, he was there. He was, uh, I guess, relaxing. But in his, in his, in his misery, in his, uh, in his disease, in his sickness, here he was for 38 years. It had just become part of his life. And the point I want to make, I want to make two or three points this morning, but the first one I want to make is this. If you're writing notes, making a meal of misery will give you spiritual and emotional indigestion. Making a meal of misery will give you spiritual and emotional indigestion. You see, verse 6 says, Jesus noticed him lying there. And the word lying there, or lying there, or laying there, in the original language, literally means reclining as at a meal. And here was this guy that for 38 years now had become so... Uh, used to the habit of being by the pool and so used to the habit of missing out that he had made a meal of his misery simply by lying down. And, and like often they would do in, in, in times and customs in that time, they would just recline at the meal and they would eat. He was doing that by the pool. He was going, and, and there are people like this. You and I know them. They've made a meal of misery throughout their life. You kind of ask them how they are sometimes, and you get an organ recital. You know what I'm talking about? You know, how are you? And you're going to go, I, I, had an, I had an aunt like that. You know, she was like, talk about a hypochondriac. She had everything going. She, if she didn't have it, it was coming. You know, it was kind of like, you know, if, if it was going around, she was going to catch it. It, it, it. And there are people like that. Our words, our, our attitude, uh, all of that have a tremendous effect on, on us and that. And so whatever gets our attention gets you. What we begin to focus on. Come on, fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Oh, I can never imagine myself being in a house like that. You never will. I can never imagine myself standing and, and, and talking like Dale did or, or Wayne or ministering in a place like that. You never will. Because if you can't put it in your imagination, it'll never come in reality. It's interesting, the scriptures say you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the word mind is the word dianoa, which literally means imagination. You will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your imagination and strength. Who's ever felt guilty? A few of us. A few of us. And we, and we feel that. We kind of feel the, you know, we come into church sometimes and it kind of like someone turns the volume and that guilt up, you know. We, we come into an environment sometimes and we go, oh my goodness. Who's ever felt holy? You know, come on, don't laugh. <laughs> come on, who's, who's felt holy? Yeah. You see, the devil's done a better job at making us feel guilty than we have done agreeing with the Holy Spirit to make us feel Holy. Because we, we intellectualize. We begin to say, well, uh, yeah, you know, be holy as God is holy. Yeah, I, I understand that. Yes, I know I'm, I'm sanctified. I understand the theology of all of that. But what, it, what, it, what does it do in our innermost being? What does it feel like? If we begin to attach our feelings, and Dale's great at doing this. She has learned so much about us. What does it touch it, to attach our feelings to the fact that God loves us? and is for us and not against us, who has made us holy, who has cleaned the slate. And we think deeply about that. Making a meal of misery will give us spiritual and emotional indigestion. You know, just a few weeks ago, we, we celebrated with Mark Ingalls, who, uh, who uh, scaled Everest. You know, that was a phenomenal, phenomenal. I mean, here he was, he, he scaled Mount Cook and and lost his legs through frostbite. And then an artificial legs on these precise, precise artificial legs that he had. <laughs> that he, he then says, Mount Cook was great, but, you know, and, and he did a, 
he did a, a, a did he do a no he did a triathlon or something rather he participated in that as well and just kept it and his legs kept on breaking and so they they kept on you know kind of he kept a mechanic with him just to keep on calibrating his legs and just refining them. and then he said I wanna I wanna do Everest and and just a few weeks ago and I know there was controversy and all of those kind of things but the fact of the matter was that he got to the top of Everest on artificial legs. He was not relaxing by the pool. He was not waiting for someone to stir the waters for him. He was not waiting for something to happen for him. But there are Christians who are waiting. Oh, well, if we just get the right speaker and, and, and if all of the lights line up in the right way and the PowerPoint's directly above and I'm sitting there and suddenly God will move and, and my life will be different. Hello. It ain't gonna happen. It's when we put ourselves in an environment. It's when we begin to, 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 to place ourselves. And even if that man, who, he begin to roll himself into that environment or, or begin to walk on his elbows or whatever it is, or maybe like Mark Ingalls begin to say, come on, I want to get and I want to I go further than I've been before. Why can't I do it? Just because I ain't got legs. And it takes G-U-T-S, guts, intestinal fortitude. And sometimes we just have to have some of that. As Christians, you know, it's kind of like, and Christians sometimes I just don't have the push through. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying, come on, guys, let's push through some of this stuff. Saturday morning, God bless you for coming out. Because what you want to say is, I want to be inspired in my local church to see how I can touch not only my community, but my nation and my world, because it's lost and it's dying, and I could be the answer. And actually, you are the answer in your family and your friends and your whānau and wherever you may be planted, I tell you, you are the answer. You are the letter that God has written on. Come and sing a new song to the Lord, a hymn of praise to Him, that those who hear it will be glad. G-U-T-S-G stands for growth. Sometimes we just have to grow up, church. Sometimes we just have to get over some stuff and grow up and say, come on, let's push through to the next level. There is a tremendous sense of growth. Look, I fiddled around for years not growing in God. Fiddled around, you know, being shy and retiring and wanting someone to pick me and being a bit, you know, kind of, oh, well, you know, you know I, I'm just, you know, I'll just wait. I'll just wait in Invercargill and, and maybe someone will notice me and, 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 all of the, and there was an attitude that had got into my heart and I tell you, I was challenged by a friend says, come on, begin to get out of yourself begin to grow up best advice I ever got I remember sitting in a car with Paul de Jong. We were, we were, um, I was picking Paul up. The first time I'd actually met him, and uh, I was picking it up from an, from an airport. And, uh, and it was right in this time when God was speaking into my life. And uh, I'd stopped off, and we had a meal together, and there was Dale and I and Paul there. And, and in the midst of the conversation, Paul said to me, Ian, he said, uh, can I say something to you? And I said, absolutely. I, you know, lay it on me. You know, amen. Glory to God. And, uh, and uh, he said, what's he going to say? You know? He said, Ian, you need to hang around bigger people. I'm listening to your conversation. You need to understand the power of association. He said, you need to be able to get out of your world. And he said, I tell you what, when you do that, he says, you'll begin to fly like you've never been flown before. The power of association. Listen to me. You are who you associate with. Show me your friends and I will tell you your future. You are the, you're hanging around with people right now, and they're talking with you, and, 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 and you're talking with them, and you're hanging with them, and, and you look at their life, you look at their ministry, you look at their influence, then, then just, just project that five, ten years in the future, because that's what you're going to be like. I don't want to hear that on a Saturday morning. You're hearing it too bad. The doors are locked. <laughs> You are who you associate with. And when Paul began to speak to Dale and I about that, then the power of association... I tell you, something just began to change in my life. There was a determination, there was a decision that I made to grow. And I put myself, I remember, I remember ringing people. Paul never rang me. He rings me now, but he never rang me then. You know, there are, there are times I had to put myself in the way of people larger than myself. I was really comfortable in my pool. 
I was really comfortable in the growth that I had. I was really comfortable in the influence that I had. But the problem was I wasn't going anywhere. And we needed to, I needed to be stretched. I needed to grow. What about you? I needed, I mean, not about you. I mean about the letter U. Stay with me on this. G, U, growth, G, guts. Stay with me. Understanding. Not only do we need to grow, we need to get some understanding. See, Proverbs 16 says this, understanding is the wellspring of life to him who has it. But the correction of fools is folly. There's an understanding that we need to get. When I understood that I just felt guilty all the time, and, and, and there was no reason for me to feel guilty, and that I needed to understand how to begin to build my church in the Spirit, how to build myself in the Spirit, how to build, how, how to build relationships. I needed to understand how to do life. I was brought up in a Christian home. I was brought up in a very conservative Christian home. We did nothing on Sundays. Everything that had to be done on Sunday was done on Saturday. I remember turning friends away from my door. You know, who come around and play on a Sunday because I couldn't go out. I was in that kind of kind of thing. And, and to this day, I hate religion. I'm like Wayne. I just, I just hate that because it just binds people up. It's a horrible thing. I tell you what, when I came into a great relationship with Jesus Christ and was filled with the Spirit, I tell you what, a whole new world began to open up for me. But I had to come into understanding of that. I needed to be renewed in my mind. I needed to get hold of some things. And to this day, there are reactions in my heart that when I get in an environment that I default back to if I let myself to when I was a kid. And I have to stand like you have to stand and say, no, 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 no. No, no, no. I'm a big boy now. I've grown up. I need to get understanding. And all your understanding. Get some wisdom on just how to renew your mind. Every year, uh, in fact, uh, in our church calendar, we always get someone in, like a counselor, like Dr. Ray Andrews, someone like that, who is going to preach to us, who's going to encourage us, he's going to be there for a week or two, he's just going to encourage our church to get good mental and emotional health, because I tell you what, the greatest battlefield we've got is right up here. The giants are not out there, they are in here. They are in there. Growth, understanding, what about T? What about just plain tenacity? I love that word, tenacity, stickability. It's just, just hanging in there sometimes. And sometimes, you know, I love that old saying, you know, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, you know. We, we've been through tough times. Who hasn't been through a tough time? Please fly around the room. <laughs> who's ne- I often say this in church. Who's never been offended in the Invercargill Christian Centre? I want you to put your hand up. No, we had a few people put oh, no. <laughs> I said, stick around. <laughs> stick around. You will be. <laughs> because there, there will be someone. Look down your row. Do you see that one? He ain't got indigestion. He's just mean. And sometimes we just have to just have a little bit of tenacity to go through. I was born again when I was 11 years old. I am 52. I've been on the way for a long time now. And, and I tell you what, there are times, you know, uh, uh, it's been tough. But I've never fallen out of love with Jesus. And he's never fallen out of love with me. There's times I've, I've kind of felt, whoa, <laughs> oh, this is tough now. This is tough now. This is painful. This is sad. All of those kind of things. My dad died. And it was sad. And my youngest son's best friend come around home shot himself and we watched our son and you watch your kids go through things they hate us hate the church hate god and you watch all of that stuff happen it's painful it's really painful and you believe god and you hang in there remember picking him off the floor of his bedroom drunk five o'clock on a Sunday morning, making sure he was okay, putting him into bed, undressing him, and then going and preaching to people, building faith, talking about revival, talking about the God of breakthrough, and going home, gain, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And then one night he comes in 
and a friend had 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 come in to, to, with him, and I'd got a real ding in my spirit, you know, when this friend came in, you know, nice looking kid, but just ding, who's ever had a ding in their spirit? You need to go to a panel beater, but that's okay, it's just like, and, uh, and I remember saying to my son, uh, just the day after, because I'd had a restless night, and I went into our spare room, and in the middle of the night, I woke up with this demonic encounter, this thing had its hands around my throat, choking the life out of me, and I was going, Jesus! I just kind of like, wow. And, and, and the thing was going through my head, two things, was going, what is this thing doing in my house? And, 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 and number two, you know, how long is this kind of wrestle is going to go on for? Because it seemed like it was going on for an eternity. And then finally, I just broke this thing up and I got up and I was angry. And, and I, remember, I, I remember just standing up in the room and just, just, just saying, in the name of Jesus, get out! Whatever you are, and, and I remember getting, going to the kitchen and getting some water and just, you know, I was trembling, I was angry, I was, what is going on? You know, what is going on? It was just like that. And then the next night, recalling this kid had come in and the ding in my spirit and my son, and he was there and, and I said to him, um, listen, uh, your friend had came in the other night, what do you know about him? And you've got to understand, my son wasn't, really wasn't talking a lot, he was like Neanderthal man, you know, how you doing? Uh, you know, you having a good day? Uh, it was just kind of like that. You know, he came home, he closed his door, he never came out. It was like a cave. It's hard work. And, um, and then we were standing by the fire, and, and, and I said about the son, he said, what do you want to know? And I said, well, you know, I just, I'm just interested in your life, you know, just friends. He said, no, you're not. He says, what do you want to know for? I mean, I know you're interested in my life, but what do you really want to know for? And I said, well, last night this encounter happened to me. And uh, I was in this room, and... You know, that happened, and I got a feeling it's associated with this boy. And he, and he hung his head, and he said, yeah. He said he's been into some really dodgy things. And then he said, actually, Dad, he said, after that thing left your room, it came into my room. I went, really? <laughs> I'm looking at him. He said, yeah, pulled me out of my bed by my ankles. And I'm sitting on the floor with this demonic thing looking at me in my room. Now, you've got to understand, I'm... You know, I'm going, I don't want to break the moment. You know, he's telling me stuff. And uh, he said, I didn't even know what to do. The only thing I knew what to do is what you and mum had showed me what to do. So and I said, in the name of Jesus, get out of my room. And he said, this thing went thum, through the wall. He said, I remember sitting back, shocked. And he said, I wonder if it's gone. I looked out through the window and here it was staring at me through the window. Come to Southland. <laughs> I know this stuff doesn't happen up here. But for him, it was really interesting that this encounter then began, he went to sleep, and then God gave him a dream. And he took him to heaven. And in the dream, here is he in heaven, he said, and he's telling me all of this. And, 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 and he said, I met the kindest man I'd, I'd ever met. He, and I said, who was that? He said, it was Jesus. He was just wonderful. He said, his eyes looked at me. And, and, and he said, Dad, he said the kindest thing he said to me. I said, what was it? What did he say? What did he say? He said, you can't come in here. And I said, that was kind. And he said, but I knew I couldn't come in. Everybody, for everything else was clean. But what I was wearing was just grubby. And I said, what, what did you do? And he says, oh, I got right with God. I said, hey, amen, that's great. But he said, then I was taken to hell. And he said, the whole horizon was like the, the tip of a burning cigarette. And he, and he said that there was these things, I couldn't see a lot, but there was these things that go whoom, whoom, past me all the time. And it was accusation and guilt and pain and, and, and everything. And then suddenly I was out of that again. And I was in a vision of, of a whole bunch of people, young people. And he, and he said there was like you know, a thousand young people there. And, and I'm preaching to them and I'm saying, you have got to get saved. You have got to give your life to Jesus Christ. And I'm going, come, come on. You know, this is, you got to understand there was nothing for months and years. Drunk, drugs, a whole deal. And then suddenly I'm having this without any warning. Apart from the demonic encounter thing, you know, just like boom, suddenly supernatural split open, you know. And, and, then, and then he goes, and then he goes, I'm preaching to all these kids, get saved. You know? And then he said, right at the back, here's this kid 
with his arms folded, mocking. And he says, it's like I lifted out of my body and I, I flew across the crowd. And I'm right up to this kid. And he said, do you, do you know who it was? I said, who, who was it? Who was it? it was me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lie down now. <laughs> now remember, as we stood there, this process took about an hour, tears running down his face were the most beautiful tears I'd ever seen in my life. I'm going, just keep crying. <laughs> just keep doing that. Just keep crying. Just keep crying. I remember praying for him. I remember holding him. I remember, I remember just, the, just saying, God, God, save him. And since that time, it's been great to see him. And it's not been rocket progress, but it's been fantastic progress. Spent a year in Bible college and come back and and just in a few months, he graduates as, a, as, a, as an electrician. And, and uh, you know, he, he's a great young guy. I remember reading books on, this book on revival, and he, he, he's kind of like this. He, he goes, uh, so what are you reading, Dad? I said, oh, I've got this book, Principles of Revival. So, oh, really, tell me about it. You know, because he's a real revival nut now. He's listening to tapes and CDs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. The, the wilder, the better. He wants people raised from the dead. He wants the power of God. He wants all of that stuff, you know. So, you know, he's just like, come on. I don't want wussy Christianity. I want the real deal, you know. And, and so that's, that's the thing. And so uh, he's, he, he sets me up. He's reading. He said, what are you reading? I said, oh, Principles of Revival. Oh, it's fantastic. You know, tell me about it. I'm doing this and this. And I'm getting, you know, you get on a roll. And I get into the preaching mode. And I'm going, oh, here, we're away now. Come on. Woo. And then he goes, aren't you just sick of just reading about it? The air went out of the room then, I can tell you. I went, here I am. Here I am. I tell you, it just takes sometimes in your Christian life a bit of tenacity. You might be going through something like that. I wasn't planning to share that. I don't share it very often. But if you are going through something like that, God is the God of breakthrough. And it's great looking back on all of that. And, and we've got stuff to do. We've got way to go. But I tell you what, the scripture, I love this in the message, it says, I'm not saying that we've got all of this together, that we've got it made, but we're well on our way. Reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for us. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal. Where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and I'm running. <laughs> no turning back. Let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything that God has for us, if anything, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the track, the right track, let's stay on it. And then S, for guts, is just the simple satisfaction. Just go, do this for me. Go, <sighs> There is a sound of satisfaction. And when you have growth and understanding and tenacity, you can sigh at the end with a satisfaction that rings in heaven. Point number two. I've got five minutes. And I've got three points. I've got fast tongues. I can speak fast too. You watch this. Number two, a decision to delight will be more beneficial than a decision to despair. Jesus said to this guy lying by the pool, do you want to be made well? Do you want to make a decision? Do you want to delight in that decision? The Hebrew says, do you want to delight in the decision? You see, sometimes in our misery of lying in the midst of all of the stuff, we don't want to delight anymore. There is a decision that we made. You see, Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to church. I was glad when they said unto me, come on, let's go to the house of the Lord. There was something, I will, I, I, I will go. The woman with the flow of blood. Remember, for 12 years she'd suffered at the hands of physician. And she came before Jesus and, and she said this, she determined and she said to herself, I love talking to myself. I love encouraging myself. Nick does it all the time. I've stayed with him a few times. You can hear him chattering away. It's lovely. She just chatters away. Just chatters. It's lovely. It's faith building. And, and, and this woman said, he said, she said to herself, 
If only I'll touch his garment, I shall be made well. Imagine coming to church with that kind of expectation. I'll be there and I'll be made well. You see, the road to miracles is, is, is just, it's, it's the highway of expectation. And, and as we walk on that, I tell you what, miracles are released again and again and again. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. What do you enter with? Do you enter his gates with thanksgiving? What do you bring when you enter in? Proverbs 4, just flick over there very, very quickly. Proverbs chapter 4, I love this. Proverbs, son, and Proverbs 4.20, it says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. They are life, say life, to those who find them. And health, say health, to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Literally, out of it springs your geographic boundaries. And where you walk, where you habitate, your words will dictate how and where you live and in what state. A decision to delight will be more beneficial than a decision to despair. Number three, when you rise up, the weight begins to come off. Because in verse 8, Jesus says, come on, get up, pick up your bed and walk. And he literally says this. I love the original language. It says, come on, rouse up, wake up as from a sleep, and take up literally to weigh anchor. You have been there for such a long time that you have got barnacles on your gluteus maximus. You, 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 you got barnacles on your bum. You need to weigh anchor, boy. You've been there 38 years. It's time to lift the anchor. It's time to weigh anchor. And it's time to move on. See, Jesus says, cast all your care upon me because I care for you. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light, my yoke is easy. See, Jesus' yoke is, is, is easy. We go, oh, it's so hard. No, 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 it's easy. And his yoke is not, you know, and, and preachers have preached it. I've preached it. You know, the yoke, you know, we've got the yoke and the, and the oxen, and, and Jesus is the other ox, and, and I'm like an ox too, and we're all oxing together, you know. And, and, and that, the, the yoke was, was the teachings of a Jewish rabbi. By the time a young Jewish boy was six years old, he had learnt, by memory, Leviticus, which is quite cool for a six-year-old to do. By the time they were 12, they had learnt Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy off by heart. And then they'd have a little test to see if they would go on uh, to, to the next part of their school where they would memorise the entire Old Testament. And then they would graduate at about the age of 30. And so... And then they would develop their teachings, which was called the yoke. And, and, and so uh, most of them learned from uh, another uh, rabbi who had authority, and, and so uh, they would take on their yoke. And there's a whole mess of messages in there, but Jesus' yoke is easy. Remember the lady who was brought to him in adultery and thrown in the dust in his feet? In the tradition of the day, she would have been topless. They would have stripped her to her waist and brought her in humiliation, in front of all of the judges and all of the men, caught her in the act of adultery, and in their humiliation, tested Jesus. Well, let's see what this guy's yoke is like. And she was guilty. Jesus knew she was guilty. And the law was the law. Jesus knew that as well. But you see, the law also needs two witnesses. That was part of Jewish tradition. Got to have two witnesses. There was a heap of witnesses there. So... Jesus sees the woman, sees all of the witnesses, and then says, well, I guess we better get to it. Those without sin, cast the first stone. The Bible says they left from the oldest to the youngest. The older I get, the more inclined I am to go. I ain't got this stuff together at all. When I was younger, I was six foot tall and bulletproof. With hair. <laughs> and so they left from the oldest to the youngest. And Jesus just drew in the dust. And then when he looked up, he goes 
to this woman, so where are your accusers? She looks around, trying to hide herself. She goes, they're gone. She says, oh, well, I need another witness. <laughs> it was only me. Now, I guess you're not going to rat on yourself, so away you go. That's the yoke of Jesus. Away you go. Don't do that stuff anymore. No wonder the demoniac was clothed and in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus, imploring him, can I go with you? Because there was something different. That's the yoke I want to live under. That's the yoke that will give me incredible life. And finally, waiting for the water to be right may leave you beached. Because you see, there are stirrings and there are movings and there are times and there are revivals and there are all of those things. But actually, if we just get paralyzed by the analysis of all of that, we will just wait by the pool forever and a day and never get healed. I want you to stand for a moment. Some of you here this morning may have had a bit of a time like I had with my Simon. That's our son. Great kid. Some of you may have, um, may just need the yoke of Jesus this morning. I want you to close your eyes for a minute. And I want to imagine what it would be like to be that woman. Guys, you can do this too. I know you can. What would it be like to be someone caught out like that? humiliated in public, and then for all of your detractors to be sent away, and then for Jesus to look at you. Yeah, I know you do guilt well. I do guilt well too. But for Jesus just simply to say to you, it's okay. Away you go. But you know that when he says, away you go, somehow he goes with you. He always does that. You can go to the deepest part of the ocean, the psalmist says, or the highest part of heaven. You can go to the caves of the world, and he's there. Holy Spirit, I want to thank you for your presence right now. Maybe for you, you just need to lift your hand and say, Oh God, I need that hand up now. Maybe for you, you've been for 38 years or 38 months or 38 weeks or 38 days. just paralyzed by offense, maybe sickness, maybe distraction, maybe sin, but the water's moving. Time to weigh anchor. <laughs> Come on. Time to weigh anchor. Just lift your hand. Amen. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Jesus. The power of His Spirit just release you in a moment of time. Maybe it's that kid at home. You think, I don't know how I can do another day. Yeah, you can. I didn't think I could too, but God's grace was there every morning. Amazing grace. Jesus. Father, right around this community of believers right now, Holy Spirit, see you working. Amen. There you go. Thank you, Jesus. There you go. There you go. Just let it go. Just say, Lord, I'm weighing anchor right now. Amen. Maybe it's those attitudes of the past. Maybe those things that, that, that are your default button. That you just, sometimes it just hits. And Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, right around this auditorium, Lord, let these things go. As we release them to you, I thank you for the release. Where are your detractors? No, I don't see them either. Where you go. God bless you.